So this is uh, Aysar Mohali and uh, on a clear day you will be able to see the Himalayas at the backdrop and um, uh, as uh, Rahul said that uh, my training is in ecology, I did my PhD from ISC Bangalore <coughs> after which I was uh, in uh, Bristol for a short while to look at uh, biomechanics of uh, sound production and I was in a basement lab shining laser at uh, the ears of immobilized crickets and I realized I can't do this for life so I ran away from there and then I was in uh, Zurich for a short while again uh, to work on meerkats a little bit of which I will tell you uh, today not my work but of the group and I realized that I have to pay a very large sum of the money that we managed to raise just to go to South Africa to do the research Uh, I was to go to work on uh, uh, whales in Syracuse and uh, people told me that you know you will have to drive around everywhere on your own and it's very cold so I did not go there and I, uh, I joined Aysar Mohali instead and this is where uh, my research group um, we have uh, students from Kashmir to Kanyakumari and from Manipur to um, Rajasthan so we basically the group spans uh, the entire diversity of the Indian subcontinent, if you like, where we <coughs> look at um, various um, topics in uh, ecology and animal behavior uh, using sound, acoustic communication as a model system, if you like, and for which we uh, use different kinds of organisms. We work on many different kinds of organisms, including insects, um, uh, bats, birds, and uh, sometimes fishes, but not for I will tell you a little bit, share my uh, joy of working with animals, understanding their uh, uh, communication system in the framework of the ecology, ethology and the evolution of these behaviors. And ethology is just a fancy term for animal behavior. So with that, this is a tree cricket. I will talk, you, uh, talk to you about the tree cricket, uh, how it communicates and uh, what is interesting about its communication. As you can see, it has uh, may, it has stuck itself uh, inside this little hole that it has chewed off from a leaf and uh, on the other hand you have a flashy vertebrate system, uh, the peacock which is most uh, famously known for its visual display. The cricket, the modest looking crickets, uh, you may not see them very often but you will always hear them. So I thought I'll tell you about this. So in general there's this huge diversity of animal communication where animals employ different sensory modalities to communicate with each other which could be either visual uh, such as the dance of the peacock which is a very, it's a visual delight of course and flashing of fireflies. Uh, it could, uh, animals can also communicate using gestures including humans, we use a lot of gesture uh, to communicate. Here you can see the uh, chimp uh, uh, infant is pointing to something on the stick which is basically termite sticking to the stick which they had pulled out from a termite mound. So this is gestural communication and uh, very recently we have had some very interesting studies from uh, uh, Indian groups in uh, Nias uh, who have For instance, if I want someone to go there, I will just gesture in that direction or we, uh, if we are surprised, we have these uh, uh, various kinds of uh, facial expressions, if you like, which are basically gestures. The other sensory modality that, animal, uh, modality that animals use is olfaction, smell and uh, here you can see a tiger which is scent marking uh, its territory and it can also be uh, used uh, to identify whether it's a breeding female or uh, it's a reproductively active and on the other hand I have shown you a vertebrate, uh, uh, invertebrate model, this is a moth and you can see the antenna of this moth is like, it's very feathery and this is basically the nose of the moth if you like, so this is what it uses to sense smell and uh, what smell are they trying to sort of capture, it is these tiny uh, uh, molecules, these pheromones which are being uh, uh, sprayed out if you like by potential mates which can then be sensed by the other uh, sex to find the location of these uh, individuals. So that uh, 
apart from that of course acoustics uh, humans use uh, acoustic communication all the time but um, communication by sound is not unique to humans animals use it all the time and uh, the problems associated with the uh, sound communication are not unique to humans either um, but in general if you look at the ethological or the behavioral context in which animals communicate there is not just diversity in the different kinds of sensory modalities they employ for communication but also the kind of function the form and function there is a lot of diversity in the function of communication it could be used to animals may communicate to signal danger that there is danger nearby or to signal that they are dangerous so this is aposematism where you have uh, certain individuals having warning coloration to indicate to the predator their, their, their toxicity said don't eat me i am dangerous or not palatable uh, it could be as some of you may know about the honey bee dance to signal food probably the honey bees are the only animals who can tell you where they went to eat to food non human animals and they do so by having this very nice uh, little dance this is a nobel prize winning uh, work in which carl von frisch showed that the honey bee dance itself is uh, a signal and it is en it encodes not only the direction in which the food is but also the distance and uh, all of this just by uh, uh, the shape of the dance the angle at which they are dancing so on and so forth to so signaling fo uh, where the food is that is also what communication animals use for uh, animals may use so this is a, a bird of paradise uh, uh one of the many species in which it has very uh, flashy uh, wing colors and it flashes these uh, very brightly colored uh, feathers but it also produces a sound and it also dances so it is multimodal communication it does all of these things to uh, signal to potential mates that uh, well i'm here and uh, the intent to mate is what uh, animals may use to communicate this is a mountain gorilla in which uh they do the chest beating and they also slap the ground and other body parts uh as an intent of aggression and some of these gestural communication also used for intent of mating <coughs> um deer in which uh, the reproductive status of the individual is uh, can be sniffed by potential mates and that is also so olfactory communication but to signal their reproductive status whether they are ready to mate are they in heat also this this is not painted on the face of a baboon it is actually a natural color this is a, a mandrill uh, uh, monkey old world monkey uh, in which the dominant status of the males is reflected in the color of the face and the alpha male the most dominant individual in the society will have very bright colors very uh, distinctly bright red coloration on the face the blue lines will still be there even if it comes down on the dominance hierarchy but the combination of these two can be used to assess that whether the individual is a dominant male and typically the dominant male also has access to all the females so this is again visual communication but to uh, suggest the dominant status uh, communicate the dominant status here it's a gestural communication where you can see one fox is sort of crouching below the other one this is to suggest that it accepts the subordinate Uh, position that it has so all of this various behavioral context in which animals communicate with each other but when you look at sound all of this is incorporated by this one sensory modality acoustic communication and uh, animals use sound to communicate for all of those behavioral functions employing different parts of the acoustic spectrum so very large mammals such as uh, elephants and whales they utilize uh, infrasound which are long wavelength uh, signals to communicate over many many kilometers with group members uh, then the audible uh, part of the spectrum is utilized by many uh, non human animals for communication including insects frogs so amphibians birds primates all so essentially you can hear all of these animals and they are around i mean on campus i have seen already five species of birds there was a woodpecker there were these babblers all of them are using employing the audible spectrum to communicate with each other so we are, we have the potential to actually eavesdrop on them if you like so all of this is there and of course we know that there are other animals such as bats and dolphins who use ultrasound for communication bats use it not just for echolocation which is for navigation but they use ultrasonic uh, uh, communic uh, sounds for communicating with nest mates who may be present in a single cave communicating so they, these are called social calls and they use uh, ultrasound for that 
If you look at animals there, uh, with respect to their uh, ecology, there can be animals that are present or active during the daytime. We call them diurnal animals. This is a purple sunbird. Um, that's, well, there's only one bird here. So this is a purple sunbird in its non-breeding plumage. And uh, this is uh, found, we have been working on this bird on Mohali campus for quite some time now. Uh, a lot about bird song is known from their breeding song or when they are uh, sexually active. But birds do produce sound even when they are not breeding. And a lot of uh, uh, birds actually have different kinds of song uh, during the breeding and non-breeding time. But in, this, in the case of purple sun, but during the non-breeding period, it looks very different from when it, how it looks during the breeding period. During the breeding period, this, the same individual will have this very flashy, bright purple color and hence the purple sunbird. This is the eclipse male, which is uh, uh, present during the non-breeding period, but does produce sound. Uh, this species is the Nicobaris long tail uh, uh, macaque. We have, been, we have just started working on this and we have found that they have different kinds of threat calls. Uh, to signal danger, different kinds of snakes uh, to which they respond by acoustic communication. They also have gestural communication where they bare their teeth and uh, this is called fear grimace where their uh, body hair, pillow erection where the hair sort of uh, stands up. But they have acoustic communication uh, to communicate the presence of a threat nearby. This is the grasshopper. I have never worked on a grasshopper, but these are all diurnal animals. They are present there. They are communicating during the daytime. We have the potential to sort of observe them and look at them. And that is why a large body of work for a very long time was concentrated on diurnal animals because we are diurnal. But there are many animals that do communicate using sound who are nocturnal. This is, a, uh, this is an insectivorous bat. And it finds its uh, prey using uh, sound, but as I said, they also communicate socially using sound. This is a moth, again found on Isar Mohali campus. Uh, it's called a death's head hawk moth. As you can see, there's sort of something like a skeleton that is there on the thorax. This image is there. And uh, moths also produce sound to communicate with each other. And the bat moth interaction using acoustics itself is uh, uh, very interesting where you have some uh, um, in a particular group of uh, moths, what was found, and this is work of Holger Gwelritz from uh, University of Bristol with Mark Holdreed, where they found that the bats produce these echolocation uh, pulses to find their food, and the moths can hear eavesdrop on their predator. And what they do is, in turn, they produce <coughs> jamming pulses in the same frequency. I'll talk uh, about jamming tomorrow. Uh, so what the moths do, they produce this sound and they jam the calls of the bat so that the bats cannot now echolocate efficiently. But there's a counter strategy that they found that th some of these bats who are specialists on eating just these kind of jamming moths. So most of the bulk of the community of insectivorous bats do not manage to eat these uh, jamming moths. But there is one uh, species of bat which has uh, specialized to eat these uh, jamming moths and its strategy is to start whispering. So it produces, it reduces the intensity of its echolocation call uh, so that the moths cannot hear it and cannot jam it and it manages to find all of these. So this is uh, again in the ecological context very interesting how prey predator interactions co-evolve but all in the framework of acoustics. <clears throat> of course, we have frogs and we have crickets. These are all, as I said, acoustically active. And I also work on crickets. One of the major model systems that I work on is crickets. I have been working on crickets since 2004. It doesn't look very pretty, but it is interesting not because of how it looks, but because how it sounds and how it produces the sound. So a cricket can uh, produce, so only male crickets can produce sound. The females are silent. And uh, the males have their four wings that have modified uh, to bear sound producing structures. What are the sound producing structures? There are tiny pegs or teeth like structure on the underside of the wing of the cricket, the four wing. And the edge of the wing is hardened and we call it the plectrum. So what the cricket does is it raises its four wings and then rubs the wing against each other. It's called stridulation. And the direction of striking this row of teeth is in the opposite direction where the teeth are facing. So in some sense, the plectrum is essentially plucking each of these tooth. 
And as the plectrum goes over this row of teeth, you may have done it, you know, you have a comb and then you take something and you make that sound. It's essentially that. That's what the cricket is doing and it's strumming this um, wings together. Why? It is doing this to attract potential females. So it is serenading for females which are which may be very far away from where the males are, but the sound is very loud. It can be up to 80 decibels, so in some cases up to 100 decibels. And uh, uh, what it does is, is manages, it has a lot of tricks by virtue of which it manages to make the sound louder than what it can potentially produce given its small size. I will talk very briefly about that also. But as it strums, as each tooth is plucked, one cycle of sound is produced. Okay? So in some sense, as the row of teeth are being plucked, you have the one, a single pulse of the cricket's call. So if the cricket's call is like you may not have heard, uh, seen a cricket, but uh, you have seen movies and all the night scenes of the movies will have the cricket sound in the background. Um, if you look at the sound, this is what it looks like. A single chirp is made up of many pulses. So these, each pulse is the result of one strike of the wing. Okay? And many pulses are grouped together. So it produces one chirp by striking its wing these many times. So in this case, five times at that rate. And then it disengages. Okay? Every silent interval between the pulse is when the wing has disengaged. So every strike one pulse, then the wings disengage, that is where the silence is. And it does that five times to produce one chirp and then disengages for a fairly long time. And this pattern of the pulse, the way they come together is essential for the species recognition by the females. Conspecific females look at the pattern of these calls and they identify whether the male is of the same species. Of course, if you look at how sound looks like in the spectral domain, how the energy is distributed across different frequencies, you can see in, in this particular cricket, it's, it drops it's around 5 kilohertz. And most of the energy seems to be concentrated around 5 kilohertz. Okay? This combination of the spectral and temporal pattern of the cricket allows unique identification of the species, not just by fellow crickets, but also uh, by us. Uh, uh, taxonomists who want to identify species. But the problem of communicating, and since it's a tiny animal, one, so the small size of the insect is of course very useful for them for many different things, such as evading predators or hiding into the small cracks and so on and so forth. But it has some problems associated with it. So a cricket is too tiny to be able to identify from where the sound is coming. So I'll tell, well, Theoretically, it should be a problem for it. I will tell you how they solve this problem. The point being that how do, if, if we are in a dark room and if there is a sound coming from one particular direction, we can tell the direction of the sound source simply because the sound arrives at very slightly, uh, with a very small time delay. It is called interoral time difference on our two ears. So it lands here, suppose the sound is coming from here, it come, lands on the right here, the ipsilateral side far, uh, earlier, then it comes to the other side because we have a head between the ears. But more importantly, it also comes with a certain pressure, uh, difference in the pressure. So it is louder on this side than it is on the other side. Okay? There is a sound shadow casted by our head. There is a head between these two sound receivers, if you like. Why is it a problem for crickets? The problem is because the ears are not on its head or thorax, the ears are on its legs. So crickets have ears, so they sing not like us, not by the vocal cord. They sing by stridulating and they hear with their legs if you like. So they have ears on their knee joints if you like. And they keep, so I, I don't have a picture in which I can show you the cricket from the front, but if you look at the cricket from the front, it keeps its legs, four legs right, right here and, and the head is right behind it. So there is nothing in between these two. Moreover, so there is no potential for a sound shadow, one. The other thing is that given that it is so tiny, a single wavelength of sound, so crickets typically produce sound in this frequency range, 3 to 7 kilohertz, and many produce, a sound, produce sound at 5 kilohertz. If you calculate the speed with respect to speed of sound, you can actually measure the one wavelength is about 6.6 6 centimeters. The distance, but the entire size of the cricket is about 5 centimeters. So there's not enough space between these two ears. So it, a single wavelength of sound can arrive 
at both the years. So there is no interaural time difference. And certainly there is no interaural intensity difference because there is no head between the years. That is a problem for the cricket. Okay. So how does it inconvenience the cricket? It, it inconveniences it because the sound is now it can hear the sound, but it can't tell from where it is coming. Why is it important? Because crickets are nocturnal. They are not active during the daytime. As I said, they are active only during the night time. And it is not possible for them to see where the signaler is. Birds can, okay, other diurnal animals can sort of, with the head movement, they can move around. Of course, it can't move its head. That's the other problem. But, you know, it could have oriented here and there and figured out. But it's a night time. It cannot find the sound, sound source. So directionality is important because the females are silent and the females can only judge the location of the males by the sound and they use the sound to come approach the males. Now, if there is no directionality, it is not going to be possible for the females to find where these males are. It's a problem. Okay? The other problem is since it's a tiny animal, the wings are also tiny and when it rubs the wings together, sound is radiating not just in the front but also the back of the wing and it's sort of a sound sphere of sound if you like. It is not large enough to prevent acoustic short circuiting which is basically sound waves from the front and the back interfering with each other and cancelling each other out, destructive interference. This can happen. If it had a very large sound producing structure then it is possible that the waves actually do not or if it had some structure in between this then short circuiting is not going to happen. But in the case of a cricket, there is potential for acoustic short circuiting and which reduces the loudness of the call because the waves can cancel each other out. So that's the other problem of being tiny. <coughs> With respect to communication, the other problem of a cricket is what is also a problem for us. Right now I'm speaking and no one else is speaking. But what if I did not have a mic? And we all start to speak at the same time, which is what happens in parties and large gatherings. And all uh, there are multiple signalers. And if a receiver is trying to pay attention to one signaler, it can become a problem. And this is not true only for uh, humans. Uh, it's also true for animals that communicate in very large groups, such as bats that are coming out of a cave and they're all echolocating at the same time. They will be masking each other out. Uh, crickets that call uh, uh, in a rainforest or a place where there are many, many different species, there are multiple individuals of each of these species, it's going to be horrendously noisy. So how do you deal with that noisy condition? That's the other problem that crickets will face. As you can imagine, even in chorusing frogs in a pond, if you pass by a pond where there are multiple frogs, it's fairly noisy. Imagine the horror of trying to figure out one sound source when you are surrounded by many. So that is the third problem. Very, very quickly, I'll tell you what the solutions are. For the first problem of not having this head between the ears and not having this interaural intensity difference, uh, this is Michelson's work and what we know from his work is that crickets have solved this problem by employing the spiracles. They are, these are little openings that insects have which is used for breathing, respiration. But there are spiracles on the thorax which are connected to each other through which also sound can enter. And what really happens is apart from its eardrums, the tympana, which are on the legs, they have two additional acoustic inputs. So it's a four acoustic input here. How does this solve the problem? It solves the problem because now the sound is entering from here and the sound is entering from here. The sound pressure level on, say the sound is on this side. So this is the ipsilateral eardrum. This is the contralateral eardrum. This is the ipsilateral spherical as in the same side of the sound. That's the contralateral opposite side. When the sound comes, the pressure is the same at the two tympana, but not the same on the two spiracles. Okay? Also, of course, there's going to be leakage of sound. from So sound can go travel from here as well. Sound waves can travel from the... So it can pass through this, but there is a membrane that separates these two, which dampens the sound even further. How does this solve the problem? Because it can still hear the same sound pressure level on the two ears because it does not pay attention to the sound pressure per se. <coughs> what it uses is the sound pressure difference on the eardrum. What is this difference? The sound pressure that comes from the spherical onto the tympanum and the sound pressure that comes from outside onto the tympanum. This side 
the sound pressure is higher here, it is also high here, but here it is weaker, here it is equally high. The pressure difference is going to be greater on that side. That means that side is the opposite side. Okay? So, they use the sound pressure level difference and not sound pressure per se for directionality. That is one way in which they solve the problem of directionality. Acoustic short circuiting where the sound waves are sort of collapsing onto each other from the two sides and cancelling each other out. What the cricket has done and this is a well not all crickets do it. <coughs> probably the only instance of tool use in an insect. This is the work of Natasha Matre and uh, several other colleagues from <coughs> my PhD lab and uh, postdoc lab. What they show is that Ecanthus, this very tiny feeble looking, delicate looking <coughs> tree cricket, it is very small and therefore the wings are also very so small, but compared to the size of the cricket of course the wings are much large, but that does not help. What the uh, cricket does is it finds large leaves and it chews the leaves to make an almost perfect hole in which it can fit in. Okay? So, it modifies an object. So, this is the first definition of tool use modification of an object. To, so, if you have a stick and with a stick if you push, push it inside a termite mound and pull out uh, in, uh, termites that is not enough to say that it has it's, this is tool use. It is just ob, it's using an object to achieve, achieve. It is a tool. You can call this tool only if it has actually modified the stick from its original shape, which is when they remove the leaves uh, and they take out all the smooth in it and then it goes inside. Then it is a tool. So, chimpanzees do that. <coughs> but here the cricket has shown this incredible behavior, which is called baffling. It, it is baffling. Uh, <coughs> What it does, it, it chews a perfect, almost perfect hole for itself, sticks itself out from this hole and then produces the sound. What happens then is you have this very large leaf which is preventing the acoustic short circuiting. And by virtue of the baffling behavior, it can increase its sound pressure level almost twofold. Okay? So, that is how acoustic short circuiting in Ecanthus Henry is solved if you like. <coughs> The third problem of masking where you have multiple noise uh, sources and uh, they are sort of you know jamming each other, they are masking each other and it is going to happen when you have many different kinds of signalers, multi-source environment where you have multiple animals who are signaling together. Um, as I said, I will talk in greater detail about this uh, in another uh, seminar tomorrow, but to very briefly if I have to give you an analogy it is more or less, do you guys know what this is, the younger people here? Yeah, it's a radio. Okay, great. So <laughs> people still know what a radio. Yeah. These are focuses. Yes. So where you can have different bands like FM bands, 93 point uh, something, okay, and 108 blah whatever radio mirchi. So you can have different frequency bands, and you can tune into this. So the different frequency bands are available, and you can tune into this different frequency band. This is more or less the analogy for what how animal crickets in large choruses solve this problem when you have multiple different kinds of signalers. Many species say for instance a rainforest where there are so hundreds of individuals around you each belonging to a different species say for instance 20 to 25 different species and so many males singing. The signalers have one of the ways in which they solve the problem is by having signaler the the call frequency for different uh, individual, uh, different species is different like I said and the receivers are tuned to those different frequencies. It's not sufficient just to have different call frequencies if the receivers can hear everything. So, at the same time if I can hear 2 kilohertz, 4 kilohertz, 25 kilohertz then I will hear all the noise related to all of these frequencies. But if my, if the signaler is producing sound only in 2 kilohertz then it serves me well to tune into this narrow frequency range. So, you have relevant signals and to have a better tuning to this you, you on evolutionary scale it is not something they are doing during the lifetime of an individual. They have evolved to have tuned ears which greatly solves the masking problem. There are other strategies also as I said I will talk about it tomorrow. So, that was the ethological and ecolo ecological context of communication if you like very briefly. But with respect to evolution, I wanted to make a few points. <coughs> Darwin 
everyone has heard of Wallace. Oh, I am impressed. So, basically Darwin and Wallace both proposed uh, the theory of evolution by natural selection. Uh, Darwin did not propose the theory of evolution, which is a common uh, misunderstanding. So, they proposed the mechanism by which evolution works, which is natural selection. What is natural selection? Very briefly, I will explain. Changes are occurring constantly in individuals and which may be reflected in the phenotype of the individual. Some of these changes are heritable and they get passed on to the next generation. If you have questions about herit heritability, you should ask Anulabha. He, he is a better uh, person to go to. But basically, certain uh, uh, when the change happens in the genome of the organism, certain categories of them can get passed on to the next generation. And this will be reflected in the next gene pool. Whether it will translate to a phenotype or not is a different matter altogether. Now, if the mutation is very harmful, so this changes or these changes are not something which is directed, not these are errors, these could be errors in copying, copying errors, which may have no effect on the trait bearer or have very deleterious or uh, disadvantageous effects or it could be advantageous. So this error could be useful or harmful or could be neutral. So now if it is a harmful error, what will happen is that the trait bearer, the individual who bears this trait may not survive long enough. Okay? So that error in some sense ends with that individual if it is the only in that individual <coughs> or it may not reproduce or at least rep not reproduce enough. So that keeps the frequency of these mutations at a low number. But if the trait is advantageous, then such individuals will proliferate better or at least at the same rate if it was a neutral change. Now these changes will gradually accumulate and what will happen is from a common ancestors we diverge. It is not like this ancestor has now morphed and changed into something else. So this idea of this we are not seeing a monkey changing into a man. It is not like the monkey is changing into a man. We have a common ancestor. We have diverged from that common ancestor. So the chimp if you like and humans we are evolutionary cousins. It is not like we have from a chimp, some some of the chimps are sort of suddenly turning into human beings. It's not like that. Okay, that is what in a nutshell, that is how evolution by natural selection works. Two key points here, the struggle for existence, one there has to be survival, the next is reproduction. <coughs> Those who are better adapted to the current environment are the ones who will survive better and also will reproduce. <coughs> now, if you survive but you do not reproduce then the copies of your genes have not gone to the next generation. So in that sense it was not useful because you do not have any Darwinian fitness. Okay? So it ends your traits end with you and therefore it is not good enough in terms of evolutionary trajectories. The second without the first one as we know is not possible. You cannot reproduce if you have not survived to adulthood. If you have not managed to reach the reproductive age and not managed to attract enough mates and mate with them, then again your Darwinian fitness is still zero. So survival and reproduction both are the key points. Now let us think of certain traits in which these two are opposed to each other. That is the paradox. <coughs> As I just briefly described, there can be traits which are shaped by natural selection. It helps you survive better and reproduce, maybe also reproduce better. But there are some traits which seemingly reduce the fitness of an individual by making them less likely to survive. And these traits could be traits like the long train of the peacock, which has, uh, <coughs> all of you have seen a peacock. It has this very long train, the male, the peacock has a long train, the peahens do not have that. And if you see the peacock walk around, it is almost like it is dragging its tail behind it. Have you ever seen a peacock fly? It is a very clumsy flyer, it is a very, very clumsy flyer, it is almost like struggling to fly from one place to the other, it seems so. Okay? So one would imagine that why would natural selection shape such a trait which seems to potentially reduce the possibility of this individual to escape from predators if you like. Having very flashy displays as in this drawing of uh, one of the species of uh, the birds uh, of paradise will attract a mate, 
but as will it attract the predators and parasites. So here again they are sort of paradoxical. So natural selection seems to be not sufficient to explain the evolution of the traits and this is how, so although Darwin and Wallace both proposed the theory of uh, evolution by natural selection, the way they were different was Darwin actually saw the problem with the theory. He found the theory of natural selection inadequate to explain the evolution of this seemingly wasteful, extravagant, ornamental characters, sexual characters and he argued that such characters could not have been shaped by natural selection as they are likely to reduce the fitness of the trait bearer. So this is the problem with this natural selection. Okay? And again, to his credit, he was not the one just to point to his problem to, of his own theories. We all get very fond of our theories, right? So we get very attached to our model systems, we get attached to our pet theories and then uh, we fail to see where we may be going wrong, but he did see where it is potentially a problem. Not just point to the problem, but also propose a potential solution. And what does he say? He say that <coughs> we may conclude that those males which are best able by their various charms to please or excite the female under ordinary circumstances are accepted. If this be admitted, then there is not much difficulty in understanding how the male birds may have gradually acquired their ornamental character. They have acquired these characters because the females like it. Okay? It is not because it has been shaped by natural selection to make them survive better to reproduce. It is because the females seem to like males who have this extraordinary extravagant character okay? and that is where he proposed sexual selection. The advantage which certain individuals have over other individuals of the same sex, of the same species in exclusive relation to reproduction that is sexual selection. Okay? Of course, Wallace was very angry with Darwin about this and apparently he also remarked that you have abandoned our child. <coughs> So Darwin proposed that these extravagant traits are sexually selected traits and as in the case of the peacocks, it is because of this idiosyncratic female who seems to like this very extravagant male. The paradox is why should the females then choose such males who are going to have this wasteful extravagant traits that can potentially, the paradox does not go away, you have given a potential solution, you have not managed to solve it completely because why should the females select such a male? Because if this trait is now heritable and that is how we argue that this trait has spread and that is how the peacock has become uh, one with a long train, the fitness of the trait bearer is going to potentially come down. So the sons who are going to have this long train, they may be able to attract females but they may not even survive long enough. right? So it still seems like an idiosyncratic choice to make. So 100 years from that, Fisher proposed <coughs> that a slight exaggeration in trait, let us assume, is indeed an indicator of better genes or higher quality of the trait bearer. Okay? Now once you assume that, then it makes sense for a female to choose those males which have this slight exaggerated character because it indicates that it is a better male, good genes if you like. So what will happen by a positive feedback loop, females are going to cho choose peacocks with longer and longer trains and those sons are going to have those traits and the daughters are going to have the choosiness of the mother. So from the father they get the long train, from the mother they get the preference for the long trait. And we are assuming at all of these states that these are, these are heritable traits and we are assuming that they are getting linked because of this way of runaway selection. As this feedback loop continues, what will happen? This superlative exaggeration is going to come about but that does not mean that it necessarily um, reflects an equally exaggerated um, uh, exaggeration in quality of the male. So a slight exaggeration was an indicator of uh, better quality but that does not mean that this long train is a, as an indicator of quality either. Okay? So this how long will this train keep becoming longer and longer and longer of course till natural selection kicks in and then after which it is not going to get any longer. Okay? But nonetheless the problem still persists. So Fisher's runaway selection <coughs> has the following consequences, extreme sexual dimorphism. So he explains how this sexual, so he has ex given an explanation as to how this can come about. Darwin proposed a theory and he proposes the mechanism by which it can work. Darwin did not propose the mechanism, he proposes a mechanism, a potential mechanism. 
Extreme sexual dimorphism can evolve because of the runaway selection. Directional female choice where the females are now going to be choosier and choosier and they are going to choose a male which has the longest strain so on and so forth. This, can, this is another consequence and the paradox however remains. Although the slight exaggeration may be correlated to male quality, the extreme exaggeration need not necessarily reflect an exaggeration in quality which then implies that this long train is no longer a true indicator of male quality. Okay? So far with me. A signal which is not the true indicator of the signaler is not an honest signal. We call it as a dishonest signal. Dishonesty in signaling is fairly common and animals do produce dishonest signaling. For instance, crying wolf when there is no predator, animals can give alarm calls. Racket-tailed drongos are known to do that where they uh, forage in mixed species flocks and they produce false alarm calls and the other species who are foraging with it drop their food out of fear and they run away, uh, fly away and scurry for cover while the racket tail swoops in and picks up the food and goes away. This is called kleptoparasitism and it is shown in the racket tail drongo not only in Sri Lanka but also in India we know it's happening. This is one form of dishonesty. M mimicking a toxic species when you yourself are not toxic, this is also a form of dishonest signaling. We know the dishonest signaling is fairly rampant in the animal kingdom, but the cheaters cannot be much large in frequency. So the mimics cannot outweigh the number, outnumber the model, okay? then it will stop to be useful. So from that notion, honest and dishonest signals, now you, the long trend of the peacock seems, once it has become this extreme exaggerated trait, it is no longer an honest signal, it seems like. <coughs> So how does this? So now Zahavi comes in, okay, another guy, three old men if you like, proposing one thing after the other, all trying to explain Darwin's puzzle that how did the peacock have this exaggerated trait. <coughs> he proposes that if you have a long train, it is likely you must be good enough. Why? Because only high quality signalers can afford to produce and maintain costly signals. Why is the long train of the peacock costly? It is costly, of course, metabolically, of course, it must be costly to produce so many feathers, have this very long train, but also because it is a cost to your own survival. Because with this long train, you have a handicap now, you cannot move around that efficiently. And therefore, if you are still bearing it and you have survived to reproduce, you must be that good. That is the handicap principle in layman's term, if you like. The trait should potentially lower the fitness of an individual or it should be costly, then it is an honest signal. Okay? And the trait bearer of these costly, extravagant, wasteful characters, if you like, are the ones who must be the superior quality individuals. Okay? Therefore, you can simply look at this extravagant character and make a judgment that if he has this very long train and yet managed to survive, evade all those predators, he must be that good and he has still, he is still around, so why not? So stable biological signals must be honest on an average and that honest signals must be costly and this cost is in terms of the survival of the individual. This is Amud Zahavi with the Arabian babblers. He passed away in 2017, very uh, elaborate body of work on the sociobiology of babblers and various other things. And uh, it was not widely accepted what Zahavi proposed because he only gave a verbal model of this handicap principle. It is only after Graphene and his colleagues mathematically showed how this can work that is when there was a bigger or gra greater acceptance of the handicap principle. I would suggest you to read this book if you are interested, The Handicap Principle, A Missing Piece of Darwin's Puzzle, Amod Zahavi. <coughs> These three men have just been proposing various potential problems and potential uh, solutions, it actually took a woman to test this out and it was Marian Putri and her colleagues uh, in Germany who worked on these zoo uh, peacocks who tested out whether these things what have been proposed by Zahavi actually holds and she tested in a series of papers in which she asked whether 
The long train of the peacock is indeed an honest indicator of male quality. Do peacocks with elaborate train have higher quality? How do we measure quality? It could be because they are better survivors, they have higher immunocompetence, they have higher fat reserves. She found that yes, or many of these things are true. And she also found that the females do seem to care about symmetry, the females do seem to care about the number of eye spots, all of the various uh, kinds of variations in this long train, the females do seem to be perceptive of this. So this is what Marian Petri finally showed that yes, the peacock is not merely beautiful, it is also honest. And this set, this entire story has been uh, written very lucidly and this is completely inspired by and taken from uh, Raghavinda Gadaka's very nice paper in Current Science and the paper itself is called Is the Peacock Merely Beautiful or Also Honest? I strongly encourage you to please read this. This entire story is there, you know, he explains why it is a problem, extravagant traits, why is it a problem, the idea of sexual selection, how Fisher contributed, how we being in India, we never tested it out. Peacocks are being culled everywhere. Ecologists never bothered to use the peacock as a model system to address this long standing puzzle that Darwin had posed. <coughs> the last bit of my talk, since I have about 15 minutes, I will talk about this extravagance. So far, we have talked only in visual characters. And as I started the whole thing, that I am interested in acoustic signaling. Uh, for various reasons. Uh, the question is, is there an extravagance in acoustic signaling as well? Of course, we know human language is unique, language is unique to humans and this is a very uh, uh, complicated form of uh, communication in which we use acoustic for communication. But in non-human animals, what kind of extravagance or complexity is there? <coughs> so the, just like the dull cricket, we have a dull and almost uh, irrelevant bird which is found everywhere including your campus which is uh, the Indian mina, common mina. And in the common mina, uh, the males and the females they look alike, there is no sexual dimorphism unlike the peacock. The dull colors and the seemingly uh, uninteresting uh, <coughs> visual appeal of the mina is compensated by its acoustics. It has a very interesting Hall. You would have heard minas in your balconies, in your gardens, coming out your windows, constantly chattering and making all these very uh, interesting sounds. And we asked the question that is there extravagance in their acoustic communication because it sounds like there is something, okay. So we started to record the vocalizations of common mina and this is all backyard science. This is a master's student who had been working on this. And what Nakul the master student with my PhD students help, he started recording this common mina from various parts of uh, Punjab. This is a spectrogram which tells you which different kinds of notes there are. You can't appreciate the differences at this moment, but I will show you in a moment. The notes look very different from each other and it seems to be producing all these various kinds of notes, many, many different kinds of notes in a single bout of song. We recorded multiple songs from individuals and we know a single bout of sound, which may, song which may last for several seconds sometimes have many, many different individual kinds of notes. And the question is why have so many? But first, how many do they have to begin with? So first we started to look at the different kinds of notes. On the x axis, these are different codes that we have given to the note types. And this is simply a rank abundance plot which tells that there are some notes which are very common like the S note and it seems to have certain other kinds of notes which are less common. But it also incorporates the mina has some very uncommon notes and the, look at the structure of the notes. Here you can see the structure. This seems like just a plain sweep across the frequency. Okay, And it has three clicks if you like. This is a very harsh note and it is almost broadband. It sounds very different. Here you have some frequency modulation, one nice structure. There are harmonics which are stacked one on top of the other. Here if you see the harmonics of course are there. But the structure is very different from that one so on and so forth. So many different kinds. This is the upsweep. There is no modulation in this way but there is a frequency modulation. There is no time modulation. <coughs> All kinds of many different kinds. number of the frequency number of times we found <coughs> on this is a spectrogram this is frequency and this is time the previous plot that i showed is just to visualize sound so different kinds of notes they are producing but how many 
we started to see how many new types of note we find in the common minor song and we have already got 202 different kinds of notes. Okay, this is enormous, this is extravagant, this is almost wasteful. Why have so many different kinds of notes? Okay, this, the common minor does offer as a model system to test the handicap principle that this extravagant trait, we do not know whether this actually relates to differences in individual fitness and whether females pay attention to this. This work has just started. We know that there is extravagance. We do not know whether the females care. Okay. <coughs> it is different because I will come to that also in a minute. These are just different unique note types which have just been put together in no specific order. When we talk about human language, and I will come to that in a minute, there is a certain order, there is a certain structure. Here, there are different kinds of notes, which are sort of, if you like, there are different kinds of uh, colored beans, which have been put together, and it seems like it is using bunch of different kinds of color beans. Some beans are more frequent than the other ones, but there is no structure per se. It is not like A comes after B, B only comes after C and D, so on and so forth. There is no structure per se. We do not understand the meaning at this moment, but we know that these are sexually monomorphic and likely to be monogamous. Okay. <coughs> but why do we expect? Yes. Uh, is the difference between habitat or across individuals? This is across individuals in the same habitat. <coughs> but we are not looking at individual specific differences anyway to begin with. At the moment, we are seeing this species offers this extravagant variety. What is this extravagance like? It is see, it does seem that there is this huge repertoire for the species within individuals also. Not all 202 nodes are utilized, but 50 to 60 nodes in many individuals we have found and if you combine these notes into the song, the song types themselves are going to be very different. If we have so if you have just take four alphabets, okay, with those four alphabets, how many different kinds of words which do not have a meaning, okay, can you form, right? And they can be repeated. You can have cert certain kind of combinatorial rules where you can repeat, you can replace, but not repeat, so on and so forth. Okay, It can be enormous. So, we are only talking about at the moment note diversity. Imagine the song diversity when you start combining these in certain forms. Okay, So, this is already extravagant. So, we are asking the question, do the females care? Why should they care? Because the there is some, yes, no, from very difficult. No. We can't even tell the sex apart. We can't tell the male apart from the female. And banding them is very difficult. We have tried for two years. We have got two minors in our misnet. We have got 65 jungle babblers. So, you say extravagant. What's the point of reference? I mean, what, who is not? For instance, the purple sunbird has 24 notes, the species. Okay, And you have um, some birds which have only one note. Okay, which is repeated again and again. For instance, if you look at the call of the crow, there is not much variety. This has variety. But why have this variety is the question. And why do we expect the, it to be interesting? We expect similar to the visual extravagance. People have shown in 2008, Slater and Cashpool, they have actually shown that females do seem to care. In some species, females preferentially mate with males who have a large repertoire of songs not notes. You already have a very large repertoire of notes and it is likely that they have a very large repertoire of songs as well. Okay, So, maybe the large repertoire is an honest indicator of male quality. There is some evidence that males with larger repertoires have higher reproductive success. It has also been found that their clutch size is bigger. So, they tend to have more successful brood than those who have a smaller repertoire size. Okay, So, then the female should now be, imagine, I am not telling you the other side of the story, I am only telling you about the signal. Imagine the horror of the female who has to now evaluate, okay, this guy is singing, he is another guy who is singing, who has a larger repertoire. So, let us not even go there. Okay, So, I will pretend that that problem does not exist. But Theoretically speaking, there is extravagance here and can they actually, does this actually mean something is something one can see. So, now coming to complexity, complexity we can, what complexity I have shown you is just this, these different kinds of nodes, many distinct kinds of different, different kinds of elements which are present. Complexity can be, you can have complexity with one single node type if they are repeated in a certain fashion. So, A, A, A or doublets, A, A or triplets, so on and so forth. With the same element, I can have a I can have three different kinds or many different kinds of uh, calls if you like. Now, of course, you can have 
combinatorial rules. So you can have only three elements in here. So here you have one song or one call type with only one, one note type, two note type, uh, sorry, uh, all three have the same, uh, only one note type, but the number of notes is different across these three. Here you have number of notes is the same, but the elements are different. It is composed of different kinds of elements. This is another kind of structural diversity. Then you can have where the same elements are combined and this is the higher order of uh, uh, complexity if you like where they are combined in a certain fashion. Okay? So A, B, C can be now combined to be C, A, B or B, C, A where nothing is repeated. So all of these various degrees and you can imagine now how it goes higher and better. This is only structural complexity in form, complexity in form. deletion or reusing elements, so on and so forth, which we do see in animals. But functional complexity or uh, what does it actually mean? What does it imply? There can be, I have taken just some words here. So you have, there are two words, run, eat. Here they do not have any common notes, right? The, word, uh, the words are formed with three elements, all three elements are different, they mean completely different things. Now if I shuffle this and make it into something else, it would be meaningless. Okay? R and U would be meaningless in our language. <coughs> On the other hand, you can have almost the same elements, but one is replaced by the other and just by this one replacement, the meaning changes completely. This is, this has, they have given it a name. Such things are called phonemes and in acoustics we say that uh, the phoneme is when, so this is the phoneme where one element that changes the meaning of this acoustic unit, this will become a phoneme. So BAT bat, when you replace T with N, it becomes, it, it has a very different meaning. It, of course, it is a different sound, but it is also having a different meaning, so that is a phoneme. Syntax would be, so black means something. Coffee also means something, but when you combine black and coffee, it means a very specific thing. Okay, so here I am talking about syntax. So these are different higher orders of complexity and <clears throat> I will give you last two or three slides which only exclusively focus on this form of functional complexity in animals. In humans, all of this is there okay? and that is why we are unique. We have syntax, we have phonemes, but there is evidence of phonemes from animals, birds. There is evidence of syntax from non-human animals as well. I won't talk about that much, but let me very briefly tell you about meaning. And for that, let me go <coughs> to South Africa. You have meerkats, Timon and Pumba, Lion King, you remember? Yeah. So this, this guy is a sentinel. They, they live in these uh, joint families, if you like. These are groups where individuals are related to each other. And one individual often goes up on a vantage point and looks out for potential predators. They are called the sentinels and they have a very interesting behavior. Who is going to go up on the sentinel post? Who is going to be the watchman? Simply because uh, anyone could be, but the problem is when you are at watch, you cannot forage yourself. So it is a costly behavior. You have to give up eating to be on duty, on watchman duty. So that itself is uh, very interesting. Martha Manser and her group in University of Zurich have been working and following the meerkats in Kalahari for a very long time. <coughs> this is from her work. I will just play back some of these. Here again you can see single note call, double note call, triple note call, multiple note calls, calls for different kind of structures and these are all from sentinels produced under different contexts. Each one <coughs> either refers to a different sort of danger. Okay. With these four different kinds of call itself, you may have been able to see some seem that there is some urgency. Okay? Some others seem relaxed and I say this at the risk of anthropomorphism, but what Martha Manser and her group have found that not just that these calls mean different things, they also, so they are meaningful, okay? they refer to something, they are referential. So what, it is a alarm call or it is a, no, a call produced in a non-alarm context. So there are different meanings. Within an alarm context, there is danger here. That is not sufficient because what you have to do when there is danger can be very different. If there is a danger from up, from the sky, 
then you have to do something else. If there is a danger on the ground, then you have to do something else. Okay, there can be different things that you have to do. So, just saying that danger, there is danger is not sufficient. So, not just contextual, but they also refer to specific categories of predators and this is not just in meerkats, in capuchin, monkeys, various other animals people have shown that this is there. The calls are meaningful, they are referential. They also show that there is urgency. In some calls, they actually show that how far danger is. Okay. So, if the predator is close by, first of all, it is an aerial predator, is it a terrestrial predator and how close is danger. Okay. Should I run away immediately or can I forage for a little bit longer? So, all of this referential uh, com communication has been shown in mammalian systems. But you know, we talked about birds. Birds are the ones that we hear all the time. They are so vocal, there is so much acoustic diversity. How come? So, till about a few years back, there was little or no evidence of this kind of structural complexity, meaningful uh, signals in non-mammalian systems and we now know that birds do have this kind of a complex uh, complexity not just in structure but also in function and <coughs> the earliest work uh, were published just within a decade or so. So, it is that recent that we have just started to discover that this is nothing unique to mammals. Of course, this precursor of language if you like, where there is meaningfulness, where there is structure and function differences, it is there in non-human animals, in mammals as well in birds. We are also looking at this uh, in birds. This is the jungle babbler, again a dull color, uh, seemingly uninteresting animal. And these are my two PhD students, Sonam and Sonia. <coughs> Uh, who have uh, been, uh, neither of them have ever seen a jungle babbler before coming to the lab. Uh, Sonam is from Ladakh, uh, Sonia is from Manipur. And when they came here and they saw the jungle babbler system, it was very fascinating because you can, and you have babblers on your campus. You have the different species, the white-headed babbler. They produce different kinds of calls and what Sonam and Sonia have already shown, and I will not go to the detail because we have not published anything so far. They do have different kinds of calls. These are birds, these are not mammals and they have different calls that mean different things. So, for instance, the first one is what we call as a contact call in which if an animal, if one of the bird is left behind in a foraging ground and the group has moved, these are group living birds. So, they live in again joint family system if you like, they have these very large groups. Well, they can also live in small groups, but typically what we call as family units. Okay. Uh, another thing they are called Saat Bhai in Hindi and Seven Sisters in uh, English and we do not know which one it is, okay, whether the group is of sisters or brothers. These calls have different meaning. This is a contact call. There can be calls which are to signal danger. There are calls which are made of single units of nodes. There are calls which are combined of different kinds of nodes to produce phrases. And what we know, and this is my penultimate slide, from chestnut crown babblers in, uh, uh, in uh, <coughs> Australia and pied babblers in South Africa and now jungle babblers in India, we know that calls, different kinds of calls are there, call repertoire is large even in um, uh, avian system, different calls have different meanings. From the chestnut crown babblers, very recently in 2017 people have shown that meaningless units can be combined with certain uh, uh, combination rules to produce, give rise to meaningful uh, units. Okay, And this is like the phoneme system and I will just quote Sabrina here. Our results indicate that the capacity to rearrange meaningless sounds in order to create new signals occurs outside of humans. So, we do have this very nice interesting, we have different kinds of languages which have structure, function, so on and so forth, but it is also some precursor of that exists in non-human animals, not just in mammals, but also in birds. And it is a potential early step towards genetic, a generative phonemic system of the human language endless forms, there is grandeur in this view of life. Whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, forms most beautiful and wonderful have been and are being evolved. And I think that is why we work on what we work. Okay? We do not get money often, but it gives us a lot of pleasure. So, thank you very much. <coughs> Any questions? <coughs> yeah. Uh, you were mentioning earlier regarding the nodes. You no, know, so normally, uh, depending on the habitat and the kind of environmental characters, the nodes can change, can right? Does true. that have an impact? 
In the jungle babbler, we don't know because we have just worked on in one kind of habitat. But what we know is the call type does not change from habitat to habitat. So the contact call still looks like the contact call uh, anywhere else and it still means the same thing. There is no dialect. No, like for example, uh, jungle babbler you would assume normally stays in a single type of habitat. But right? it is very widely distributed uh, across India. It is found from the foothills of the Himalayas till uh, no, Actually, Kerala. my question is more directed towards the common miner. Ah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. There, uh, yeah, it's quite possible. It is possible that different habitats, uh, the repertoire, the note types may be different. We don't know. We have seen in three different parts of Punjab. But if we were to sample in, I don't know, in IMSC, they are calling around the guest house. Maybe we find new notes. We don't know. Well, you have the mobile phone. These are all in the audible range. Uh, I'm Hopelan. Uh, I'm a oh, ecology researcher. Oh, <laughs> okay. We should talk. Uh, okay, I'm Swarna from uh, WCC. I'm studying chemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what happens if some uh, bird or an animal uh, encounters a new situation where it doesn't know how to react to it? Uh, does it produce a new type of call or? So whether it produces a novel call just out of the blue, uh, it is unlikely because there are certain kind of. So of course within. Uh, some calls which they don't use typically in their day-to-day -day activities, they do still have the ability to produce certain calls. For instance, when you misnet them, which is not something that they are going to face every now and then, they do produce different kinds of calls called distress calls. But it is not something that I would imagine that will come out of the blue. They should have the ability to produce these calls. It is just very rare in occurrence. So we just don't How do know. they learn calls? Learning is a different matter altogether. So learning is where you can have mimicking birds where the habitat itself will matter. You have you if you are in if you are a racket tailed drongo which is in a rainforest where you are surrounded by the chloropsis and various other kinds of groups of birds, you learn different kinds of new notes versus if you were in a, a grassland where you have a completely different set of species. So there it will those habitat related differences will also be there, note differences will be there, learning will also be there, but not in these. These are innate. Anyone else? So in the interest of okay. Uh, Lava has yeah. we can also talk yeah, yeah. No, no, but you can ask no. No, uh, so is this extra because of Modes connected to selection uh, in some sense. Well, like, I mean, like a visual extrovert. You mean sexual selection or natural selection? Sexual selection. Should or be. Natural. But I mean, natural, I don't know how to test it. But sexual selection, I would imagine, yes. But is it somewhere? So for peacocks, they have shown that they have better genes, so to say. For bees, has anybody shown that they have better genes? This is the first study on the. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so. The meerkats, hmm. uh, how do they choose which individual will go for the behavior? This is coffee time discussion. It's a <laughs> long story. Yeah. Yeah, there is rotation. And how do they decide who goes next? Thank okay. you. Yeah,